past couple weeks, I've been teaching the Constitution in my class. And last Friday, after I get done teaching, one of my students comes up to me, and I know the question that's coming up. She says, Mr. Heenan, can I please have some extra credit? And I knew this was coming because I'm watching her in the back of the, she's in the back of the classroom. I'm watching, and she goes, and she's totally disengaged. She's like, ugh, oh. and I'm like, okay, what's going on in my mind? I'm like, okay, she's totally disengaged. Nothing I've been saying is relevant or valuable. What am I teaching for? Why is this teenager not interested in what's happening in 1787? <laughs> and I say, okay, that's fine. I, none of that, I didn't say any of that to her. I say, absolutely, you could do extra credit. You just have to do one thing, make it relevant and make it valuable. So I turn the tables on her. And at first, because I know actually, I also know what's coming next, she says, her eyebrows furrow, and she goes, can I just do some questions in the back of the book? And I say, no, 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 go home, you know, have a good weekend, and come back and produce something of value for us in our community. She comes back on Monday with a poster, very proud, ready to hang in the classroom on students' due process rights in the school. I say, all right, that's something of value. That's something that's relevant to the people in the room. Okay. I teach at Curie High School. It is on the southwest side of Chicago. It's one of the three largest high schools in the city. The students that are coming from the neighborhood are mostly first and second generation, many of whom are undocumented, and bring to the classroom a lot of challenges that comes with an official legal status. The students that, oh, we also pull students from other neighborhoods around the city because we are a magnet program that offers performance arts, visual arts. We have award-winning business and tech. We have excellent media, as Sylvia is related, and we also um, have an IB program as well. I don't teach any of those. I teach social studies, and this is a lot of what I get. <laughs> if you can't see the disengagement, let me highlight it for you. YOLO. <laughs> In the student parlance of carpe diem of the day, this uh, phrase is appropriate for both let's pull an all-nighter and study, or let's pull an all-nighter and party. YOLO, you only live once. So I am in the position of having to figure out how do I win the hearts and minds of the young people, especially those who are disenfranchised by a system that looks to ignore impede, and even criminalize them. When I came to Curie High School, I started a, uh, I inherited a program called Forefront. It's a student leadership organization that employed the Mikva Challenge curriculum of Youth Voice. And each year we would have the students pick issues that were important to them. They would problem solve around those issues, and then they would present them at the end of the year. I had no idea, being from outside of Chicago, what our students' issues were. So I needed to learn very quickly. So, and in, in so doing, I, I did the professional developments that were offered by MIPA, by Facing History. Uh, and I learned very quickly that from, from the mentor teachers that were also participating, I was learning about this educational justice movement that was very much related to the needs of our young people. Our young people were coming to school dealing with homelessness, with joblessness. There were transportation issues. There were safety concerns. You know, one of my students that came from the, the far north side of the city, she said she has to get up at 4 a.m. every day to get to school. I'm like, wow, that's really challenging. She's like, no, you don't get it. I get home from work at midnight. When I was supposed to be administering one of those YOLO-like tests, I'm reading a, a book on my own, and I'm, I'm reading this quote, blessed be the agitator whose touch makes the dead walk. Blessed the organizer who discovers his strength in wounds. And I realize when I'm at my best, when I'm facilitating a classroom, I am these two things. As William Butler Yeats would say, or did say, education is like lighting a fire as opposed to filling a pail. When we're making the issues relevant to young people, when young people are bringing those relevant issues in, they're able to organize around them and valuable. So what is relevant? Our young people year after year find these issues to be what is relevant to them, what is important in their life. Because they're not getting resolved, but because this is what our young people are dealing with. 
At the beginning of the year, I pick an issue and we model it together, what, what we do in the classroom. And I pull from my organizer toolkit to demonstrate that. And then at the end of the year, or the middle of the year, the springtime, they pick the issues many times from one of these lists okay, that they produce uh, to address those concerns. Last year, I picked the issue of homelessness. This is a student came up with the title Project HAM, Homelessness Awareness Month. But what we would do is engage young people in the process of problem solving. And homelessness is a really excellent issue to organize around, partially because it's a pervasive civic issue and it's extremely complex. Young people come with a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of stereotypes about what homelessness look like, not unlike many adults have. And so there's a lot of ways in which analyzing homelessness can go, a lot of routes. I ask two things in my students. This is what I model. I ask them to build expertise, which looks like, and I tell this to them, read the word and read the world. They can read books. They can read uh, other forms of text, the internet, but they also have to access practitioners and people in the community who know about that. Build expertise, and then also have a pitchfork strategy. A pitchfork strategy in the organizing world, and I get this from the ADAPT disability rights community. This is attacking a problem in a multi-pronged way. So it really adapts well to the classroom because we have a various, descent, a various diverse group of learners who can learn things in multiple ways. So we do this because it's not one style fits all. We partnered with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and this partnering worked very well because they have a track record of working with young people and honoring young people's voice. I think that there are a lot of um, groups out there, organizations out there, who say they want to work with young people and not necessarily want to include them in the process. We need to be careful when we introduce those groups into our classroom. We did things where, uh, such as listening sessions and panel speakings, what this is accessing expertise. Um, our young people were introduced to homeless and formerly homeless individuals and understood with opportunities to understand the complex issues surrounding why these individuals became homeless. I had students realize, or didn't realize before, that they were homeless. Very empowering. We used texts that came from our community. If you don't know Mike Royko, He's no longer with us, but he was a journalist from our community, from the Chicago community. He's very much honored for what he would say and how he would speak truth to power in a very engaging way. The text on the left is the, from the Chicago Grassroots Curriculum Task Force. This is the first volume of eight on land grabs and gentrification and the effects of them. Now, I want to make something very clear. It is easy to align these texts from, to standards. These texts do not come from standards, and that's going to come up a little bit later in my speech, but I want to point that out. Uh, we took our young people to Springfield, and in a year where we, fiscal, uh, we were making fiscal cuts across the board, our, our young people, by speaking with senators and representatives directly, were able to secure $4.6 million. That is a $500,000 hike in support for homeless individuals and education programs. The impact is felt very personally, too. This is Xavier. I want to point out at the bottom, he says, I felt like I was in control. We are asking young people to go to school every day until they either graduate or drop out. So to feel like you're in control as a young person is a unique experience. It's very empowering. This is Stephanie. Stephanie is like many of our young people in that she's seeing all these problems in her community and feeling, before she gets into experiencing how this works, how we can problem solve, she's feeling like very disempowered. Like, how do I do this? What effect can I have? Now she's engaging with her community on anti-gang initiatives, church. And then lastly, this is Tim. Tim sees himself as an advocate. Tim is about to graduate. And unfortunately, I cannot win them all. Tim wants to be a lawyer. <laughs> In the middle of the year, I ask the students to produce what they've done in a relevant and valuable way for their peers to judge as part of their assessment, demonstrating the skills they've taken on and what they've learned from the actions that we've done. We see hard skills and soft skills of students reading, writing, and speaking improve, but we also see self-efficacy. We see advocacy for the community members. We see the ability for young people to make connections in professional and personal ways where that wasn't, uh, it was happening 
ineffectually or, or in, in other ways before me, perhaps. And it's not just my class. We see this across action civics classrooms across the country. We see better grades overall. We see better graduation rates, increased graduation rates, and a stronger bond to community and school. But I want to make a shift in the discussion here because this is not happening only in civics. It's not happening only in the junior seniors. It's across grade levels. It's across classrooms. But it's becoming more rare and becoming more difficult to do this to the point that teachers who design lessons in this way are actually being subversive. Let me explain to you why. Here's what I do. We take the relevant topic that is relevant to young people's lives, we make it valuable, and we approach that solution, we have a problem. But what's being demanded of us is very different. We're supposed to start from standards that are most likely irrelevant to young people. We must design assessments based around those standards, and then we decide what activities to do. Only then. Now, this is the result. It's akin to saying, let's put our young people in a box and say, as if you were plants, this is as much as you can grow. Where is the creativity and youth voice when we design curricula this way? Of what control do young people have? So let's go back to YOLO real quick. <laughs> what can we tell from this? Well, let me give you a little bit of backdrop. This test was taken on October 22nd last year. I'd done the calculations by about this time. This young person had taken over 735 minutes worth of standardized testing already this school year. So what do we know? We do know that this person has a sense of humor and probably pretty good geospatial skills. <laughs> what we cannot know is whether or not this young person knows the material. We know he or she is not willing to show us in this assessment form, but to say, as many people who are reading the data would say, that this person does not know it is a false conclusion. We must immediately <laughs> we must immediately eliminate all high stakes associated with standardized testing. That includes high stakes on students, on teachers, and on schools in general. I make three other recommendations. We would need to make sure that educators have the ability, the autonomy, and the support to customize their own professional development. We need to make sure that we have access to mentors who are experienced teachers in that which we want to do with our young people. We need to make sure we include our community partnerships in a very effective way. And lastly, we need to replace learning standards with standards on facilities and teachers, the adults in the room. Because when we say that these are what, as far as we're, what we're teaching for, that's going to be a very different product than if we put it on the adults. So I want to leave you with this. For what do I teach? Well, I want to bring up Herbert Spencer. About 150 years ago, he said that the gate aim of education is not knowledge, but action. We need to make sure that the extra credit is the everyday. Thank you. <laughs>